Hi. My name is JC McCauley. I'm Naisha McCauley, and, and you're, you're watching, watching AccessTV.org. State Senator George Logan, you're tuned into the Senate Reports on this Tuesday, June 5th, 2018. Today we have the privilege uh, and the pleasure of having the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services Commissioner Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman here with us today. And we're going to talk about issues related to the department, related to uh, mental health, and whatever else she has on her mind. Uh, Dr. Rittman, good to see you here. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for coming again. This is your yeah. second time on the show. The last time you go around, you gave us a lot of great, useful information. Glad to have you with us here today. Mm -hmm. I want to start with at a very uh, basic level. Yeah. Um, if you can just uh, give us a little, tell our viewers a little bit about your background yeah. and what led you to this important role uh, in mm -hmm. the Connecticut government. Yes. Yeah, so I'm a clinical community psychologist, mm -hmm. and I've always been interested in sort of the intersection of sort of research, policy, um, and broad scale system change. Mm -hmm. um, prior to being commissioner, I was uh, on the faculty at Yale in the Department of Psychiatry. I was the director of cultural competence and health disparities research and consultation. Um, and prior to that, I did a two year uh, appointment at the White House uh, working at SAMHSA. Uh, so the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Well, how was that experience at the uh, White House? It was awesome. It was it was wonderful uh, just being part of uh, the Obama administration. Sure, sure. Um, the SAMHSA's vision and their impact uh, across the country is just is just tremendous. Um, and so it was, it was a wonderful experience for me to be part of developing policy mm -hmm. um, that now at the state level. Uh, we're in the process of implementing. I think that's uh, so wonderful. That was a great experience. Bringing that experience and knowledge you developed there over here to, uh, to Connecticut and being able to utilize it. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, DEMAS and the services uh, uh, Departmental Health and Addiction Services provides to the state and to our various communities there? Yeah, absolutely. So DEMAS, we, we're the lead state agency that offers mental health and addiction services across the state. Okay. Um, our charge is primarily to work with adults, yeah. although some of the community agencies that, that we fund uh, will work with uh, young folks as well. Um, our prevention services are lifespan, so focusing uh, not just on adults, but uh, adolescents and younger folks and, and really the full lifespan. Um, so, so, you, again, so you work with uh, uh, organizations at the local level as well? You help fund it? Are these nonprofit organizations? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah oh. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, our system is pretty broad. I mean, we have uh, about seven state-operated mm -hmm. uh, local mental health authorities, but then we also have um, six uh, private nonprofit local mental health authorities that we fund, in addition to about 160 um, community oh. private nonprofit agencies. Um, so our system is really comprised of both state-operated facilities and then community providers um, that we partner with and, and that we collaborate with around sort of promoting mental health and addiction and wellness services. Oh, that's super. And yeah. a little later on, we'll chat about ways that folks can connect and, and get a hold of folks to talk about the services that may be available to them in the state, right? Yes, uh, I absolutely. Think, I think I kind of uh, uh, interrupt you a little bit when you're talking about Demas and kind of some of the service that you provide, but please yeah. feel free to continue. Yeah, so on. we provide just a broad range of mental health and addiction services, all the way from um, outpatient, uh, community recovery services and supports. Um, we also have inpatient services, um, mental health inpatient, as well as detox services, um, and then a full continuum of services uh, on an outpatient basis. So we help people with employment, housing, wow. um, social rehab. Um, we have faith-based initiatives uh, mm -hmm. where we connect with churches okay. uh, and, and faith communities to help people uh, increase their awareness of our services, but mm -hmm. also increase their likelihood of accessing our services if they need help. Wow. And how's that yeah. coming along, particularly working with the faith-based uh, organizations? Um, it's wonderful. We have an initiative going on right now that, that's looking at um, um, really the full addiction spectrum, but, yes. but doing some focus work also on the heroin and opiate crisis. Ah. Um, it's a network of churches uh, uh, in the New Haven area. Okay. Um, we are ultimately looking to expand that. 
Uh, I grew up in, in New Haven, in oh, the hill section so, in New Haven, so oh, quite familiar. Okay. Yes, my mother actually still lives in New Haven now. Oh, but, wonderful. But so I'm glad to hear that you have a lot of services yeah. providing in New Haven. Yeah. It certainly needs it, for yes, sure. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, unfortunately, in terms of the heroin and opiate crisis, it's something that we're seeing. We're seeing sort of usage yeah. rates and, unfortunately, overdoses across the state. Yeah. Um, all communities have been impacted. Sure. Um, and Connecticut, unfortunately, is not that different from other states, mm -hmm. uh, really across the country. Uh, people being impacted by this crisis. Wow, so I've heard, uh, I've got some statistics here. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, opioid crisis and overdoses. Uh, there were um, 1,037 uh, overdoses in Connecticut in 2017 alone. alone. So that's yeah. just one year one. in our small state of Connecticut. That That is just uh, amazing. If that doesn't ring the uh, alarm bells for a crisis. I don't know what uh, yeah. uh, what does. Over, over Overdose deaths have nearly tripled, tripled since 2012. Yes. Uh, yeah. More than half of the overdose deaths in 2017 were fentanyl related. And this yes. is some sort of synthetic type of, uh, of drug. Uh, yes. Please feel free to elaborate. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, fentanyl we're finding, you know, of the overdoses in Connecticut, as you mentioned, half of them were fentanyl related. Wow. Um, fentanyl is a very, very strong, uh, synthetic opiate. Mm. It's 25 to 50 times stronger than heroin. That seems um, incredible. It's incredible. 25 to 50, 50 times, times stronger than, than heroin, heroin, which is considered yes. pretty pretty heavy duty yes. in the drug yes. spectrum there. And 100 times stronger than morphine. Wow. Um, and so just a small amount right. can contribute to overdose. Wow. Um, and the thing is, we're seeing not only fentanyl, but we're also seeing carfentanil. Um, we've seen a bit here in Connecticut, but certainly around the country, we've seen it more. Um, carfentanil is 10,000 times stronger than morphine, so 10,000 times. That's amazing. Um, and if you if you look at it, it's like a grain of it, a little bit bigger than a grain of sand, uh, can contribute to overdose because it's so potent. So folks are really, I mean, taking a serious risk when they uh, monkey around and, and experiment and, 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 and try and become addicted uh, to heroin, that particularly that's laced with these yeah. Um, with these synthetic uh, drugs, yeah. um, but yet the numbers keep rising. What, what, what's your opinion? What do you think the uh, attraction is to this, uh, you know, type yeah. of uh, uh, addiction in, in life? Because it seems like it's something that doesn't doesn't end well uh, for many people that delve into this yeah. Uh, realm. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, the overdoses have continued to rise, um, and for many people, you know, they they certainly talk about, you know, it wasn't their intention to become addicted to heroin or mm -hmm. opiates or um, for many people their usage started with, um, you know, maybe they had a sports injury or a dental uh, extraction where they were prescribed uh, um, a painkiller. Yes. Uh, and, and it can quickly become addicting. Right. Um, and there's also been over prescribing. I mean, that has been a challenge countrywide. And so some of the uh, legislation, as you know, in yes. the state has, has focused on um, reducing the number of pills available to, to somebody who's receiving a, a first-time prescription, particularly young folks. Right. Um, young folks now, as a result of some of the legislation that's been passed even last session, as you yeah. know, yes, <laughs> being part of the public health, is that uh, you know now a young person will only receive five days of medication that's as opposed right, to seven. Wonderful. Yeah. Right, and the education, even to the uh, providers, the doctors yes. that are actually prescribing these to make sure that they understand and that they actually uh, yeah. convey some of that information to folks that are getting the scripts. I remember Absolutely. I had yeah. uh, foot surgery uh, uh, several years ago, five or six years ago, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I remember I was uh, given uh, um, uh, oxy, uh, cotton, and Percocet, mm -hmm. and I was I had surgery. I was given a script, so I did my duty. I went and I got both of those. Mm -hmm. And the doctor said, "Well, if this doesn't uh, this doesn't help you here, try this you know this other one." And mm -hmm. I took one of the two. And I remember how loopy I was. And I said, "What in the world did he give me?" That's when I looked at it and I yeah. saw you know oxycontin. I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Yeah. Without any sort of uh, warning, uh, any sort of you know. And I had two pills of them, and so I wow. stopped. Uh, you know, I didn't take them, but then I didn't know what to do with the pills. Yeah, I held on to the pills for like three months because I didn't want my children to somehow accidentally find them. I didn't want to yeah. flush them down the toilet until. I yes. came to one of those uh, um, uh, prescription drugs recovery yeah. uh, uh, station sessions. I was able to get rid yeah. of it. But amazing. Yeah. We've come a long way, I think, in terms of awareness yes. of, of these types of issues. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And the, the drop boxes have really been making an impact. Um, there are now drop boxes available across the state. So oh, really? in police departments, they're available. Excellent. Um, right in the foyer at the police department. A uh, person doesn't even have to go all the way in. They can just go in, drop their pills right there.
right there in the foyer. Um, well, that's good information. Yeah. So most yeah. pol most police departments, and particularly the yeah. urban areas, they they have a drop box, and folks can yes. drop those types of prescription drugs off at the police local police department. Yes, good to know. Yes, and you can check out our website or the uh, DCP, so Department okay. of Consumer Protection here in Connecticut. Okay. And there's an interactive website. You can click on your town and see where the the closest drop boxes. Excellent. Yeah, okay. wonderful. And and last year alone, between the drop boxes and the drug take back day, yeah. thirty seven pound, thirty seven thousand pounds of medications were collected. That is thirty seven thousand. That's just in Connecticut wow. alone. And and so if you think about it, I mean, one pill probably weighs wow. close to nothing. Right. So thirty seven pound thousand pounds. That's a lot, that's a a lot, lot. of pills. Yeah. Right. It's really and that's a lot. wonderful. So that's. Uh, taking out of uh, you know vanities and and and, um, and bathrooms and That's homes, right. yeah. uh, not being flushed down the toilet into the environment, which causes right. all kinds of other issues yeah. uh, uh, as well. Yeah. Again, yeah. the awareness I think is wonderful. And I think Demas has played a, a very uh, a crucial and important role in bringing out that awareness. So I thank you very much for yeah. uh, your your service and your help and information getting out there. Yeah, now, you're welcome. Now we've got a couple more segments. Hope you can okay. you can hang around for us for a little I bit. Can. We're going to take a little a little bit of a break. Okay. And again, I'm a state senator. George Logan. You are tuned into the Senate Reports. We're here with the uh, Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services Commissioner, Dr. Mir Miriam Delphin Rittman, and we'll be back after a short break. Thank you. You know something? Harvard's strength is the people. They're independent thinkers and love their city. So how did Hartford fall into the hands of rogue policymakers? Well, to start, this rogue group spent nearly one million dollars putting themselves on the inside and leaving you out in the cold. What if I told you that five dollars can be the difference between a Hartford with hope and vision or a Hartford that is in perpetual decline, increasing crime? and an educational system going nowhere fast. Your $5 contribution to our team is a statement that you are investing in Hartford's future. Your $5 contribution to Macaulay for Mayor will make you a member of the team, and together we will explore the possibilities. More than that, you will be demonstrating that Hartford's people are ready to make a stand with Stan. Our goal is to get the support of 5,000 people who live, work, and play in Hartford. I'm asking you to make a bold statement by contributing $5 right now, today. If you believe in Hartford and its people like I do, make that contribution. And together we will show Connecticut that the people of Hartford care enough to do our part. We are ready to pick up the ball and run. The people of Hartford are back in the game. And we're in it to win. My name is Jay Sam McCauley, and I approve this message. Hi, I'm State Senator George Logan. You are tuned into the Senate Reports here on this uh, uh, Tuesday, uh, June 5th, 2018. Um, I'm here to continue our conversation with the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services Commissioner, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman. Uh, earlier we were talking about uh, issues such as uh, the over uh, opioid crisis. Uh, we're gonna chat a little bit more about that uh, now. Um, welcome, doctor. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Good, good to yeah, see you. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. No, thanks for being here. Um, so to continue our conversation on the opioid crisis, can you talk about uh, what the state is doing uh, to help address uh, opioid misuse? Uh, what is the, uh, we talked about the drop box a little bit, yes. um, but what is the uh, change the script campaign? Yeah. Yeah, so this is a campaign. We're, we're really excited about this. We were uh, awarded a grant through SAMHSA 
uh, it's called the State Targeted Response Grant. And so this campaign is funded through that broader statewide initiative okay. um, that's federally funded. And SAMHSA uh, is, a little bit more about SAMHSA, that's a federal, is that a federal program? Yeah, federal so it, okay. it's the federal uh, department that uh, addresses mental health and addiction services across ah, the country. Ah, okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, and so the uh, Change a Script campaign mm -hmm. is uh, one of our prevention efforts that we're using to help increase awareness across the state. Okay. Uh, it's essentially targeting the general public um, as well as uh, prescribers and pharmacists. Okay. Um, the nice thing about it is it's a campaign that's adaptable. Okay. Um, community mm -hmm. members can take the materials and do programs within their own community. Um, so it includes things like PowerPoints, posters, handouts, oh my, radio wonderful. snippets. Um, you know, web information. It's just a full adaptable campaign. Um, and we're even doing billboards around the state. And I love billboards because there's nothing like when you're stuck in traffic yeah. <laughs> and you can just see the billboards there. It's a great, great way just to get I, information out about I think that's uh, ways great. to access services. So these materials that you're talking about, yeah. folks can go to the Demas uh, website? Um, they can go to our website. Yeah. They can also go to the uh, Drug Free Connecticut CT website as well. Okay. Um, they're available there. Um, and anybody can download them. Um, the uptake, we're already seeing uptake in communities across the state Super. where people are actually using the PowerPoints, the handouts, the brochures. Wow. Uh, there's there's uh, radio announcements. So really just a full package of materials um, geared towards increasing awareness. That is super. And I'm yeah. sure there's many folks, many folks that are listening and watching this program that aren't aware of that. Yeah. Uh, so I certainly encourage them to uh, to do that and grab, grab that information either for themselves yeah, or, you know, for whether it's at um, a local level, local organization or at their schools yeah. and that sort of thing. Yeah. I'm sure you encourage that as well. Do you yeah. have uh, Do you have people or folks that uh, are available to go out into the community uh, on a sort of request basis to talk to organizations and groups and folks and that sort of thing. Yes, absolutely. So we do, we fund uh, groups called the Regional Behavioral Health Action Organizations. Oh, that's a mouthful. It's Repeat a mouthful. That again? It's, what is truly, again? it's truly a mouthful. Yeah. There are um, Regional yeah. Behavioral Health Action Organizations. Um, each region of the state, there are yeah. five of those organizations. Okay. Um, so each region of the state has their own designated, we call them RBAHOs. That's another sort of tongue twister, but. Got um, and yeah, so they are available to do um, forums or uh, specific trainings uh, oh, on request wonderful. if a community um, is interested in that. Um, we've collaborated with, with each of them and we've done forums all around the state. Okay. Um, and that's been such a, I think, a valuable way to get information out there about right. the services that are available, about how to access services, um, and then also just to answer people's questions. That's you know, right. People often have questions about sort of what to do if a family member is struggling or where to go if somebody needs a bed. I mean, I think that's a, a huge issue. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of individuals, yeah. a lot of families are just uh, are surprised by this opioid crisis when it hits home directly. Yes. Uh, now, as far as I can tell, mm -hmm. uh, this is not something that's uh, uh, limited to uh, uh, suburbs or it's not limited to uh, urban areas. It seems to be um, you know, scattered throughout uh, every corner uh, of the state. Has that yeah. been your experience in terms of the data that you've seen? Um, that is absolutely the case. So our data shows that all communities of the state have been act impacted. We have wow. 169 towns and and I think unfortunately we're at the point where just about every town has experienced um, some level of overdose or people needing to be reversed on Narcan. Wow. Um, and so every town has been impacted unfortunately. Wow. Um, and so we're really working to get information out really across the state. We've done forums across the state. The Change of Script campaign materials, we're really encouraging people to take right. those, download those handouts, right. uh, certainly hold programs in their, in their communities. Uh, and, you know, we're happy to support people however they need to be supported in those. That's super, because I, I certainly find, in my own instance, in my communities, I find families, again, that are just surprised and they don't yeah. know what to do. And, and oftentimes they, uh, they um, feel a alone in dealing with this sort of uh, issue or, or circumstance. Mm -hmm. And it's good to know that if, you know, if a, a family member or a parent or a brother or sister mm -hmm. um, uh, realizes that a family member has or a friend has yeah. this issue, um, mm -hmm. there is someone they can go, right? They can go to the Demas uh, website and there's yeah. help and there's information yeah. uh, available to, uh, uh, to help out. I think that's yeah. extremely critical and extremely important yes. uh, for helping us to really get our arms around 
uh, this opioid crisis uh, yeah. issue. Absolutely. I mean, one thing that we often encourage people to do is to call our 1-800 number. Uh -huh. um, so it's 1-800-563-4086. Excellent. Um, that's our access line. Okay. And so they can call that line and get information about where in their community um, they can access services. Um, they'll receive a screening on the phone, and if they need detox, we'll give them a ride to detox. We'll, right? we'll pick them up if they don't have transportation yes. or aren't able to drive, and we'll give them a ride to detox. So if someone's in, a, in an immediate crisis situation and they want help yes. to the point where they need actually a ride to a detox center, yes. th the state will uh, provide that uh, transportation to we, get him or her, this person there. Absolutely. Wow. We'll pick them up and give them, because we don't want transportation to be a barrier. Right. And we know for some folks, you know, maybe they, if they're not able to get there right. on their own with a vehicle or, and so, you know, we'll give them a ride to detox if necessary. Wow. They have yeah. to provide an insurance information or uh, lots of identification or lots of forms to fill out? No forms. Okay. A car will show up yep. and bring them right to detox. Wow. Excellent. Um, you know, once they're at the site, sure. then they'll deal with insurance, you know, to see do they have if insurance, they have but re regardless, you know, by... By definition, yeah. DEMIS, we serve individuals who are uninsured or underinsured. underinsured. That is our charge. Um, but this line is also available for others that may have insurance as well. Super. So anyone in the state can call. Yeah. Um, and there, there actually are a range of services in, in many communities around the state uh, that maybe sometimes people may not know about. And right. so with the access line, um, they can get information about what is available. That's super. Crisis yeah. situation, we consider a life or death uh, issue, and we uh, are dealing with that public health issue first and, f and foremost. Yes. And all the other uh, uh, bureaucracy really, uh, that goes along with it is secondary. Secondary. To helping that Sorry. person in crisis and that family in crisis yeah. or in need. Absolutely. Uh, that's good to know. Because ultimately it's about saving a life. Right. It's about saving a life and giving people the opportunity to move into long-term recovery, that's um, which we know is possible. I mean, there are people all across the state yeah. that are living full, whole, meaningful lives uh, in recovery um, from mental health and addictions. And I think that's the other important message I like Absolutely. to get out there, that it's important for people to have hope, yes. um, for them to know that they're not alone, yeah. um, that there are other people that have, have walked a path maybe somewhat similar to what the path that they're on. Um, and we'll connect them. You know, if somebody wants a recovery coach or a recovery support specialist, um, we can help make those connections so they don't have to go through this on their own. That's right. So that, that brings me up to the, the next point. You mentioned the word, they said, uh, Fraser, recovery coach. Yes. So what are recovery coaches? Can you give yeah. me a little bit more about the recovery coaches? That sounds like a very, uh, a, you know, another crucial yeah. aspect uh, to this whole uh, plan of attacking the yeah. opioid crisis. You know, the, our recovery coaches, so they're, it, it's a, a partnership right now that we have with CCAR. Okay. Um, so the Connecticut Community for Addiction Recovery. Okay. Um, they offer a training where they train people to be recovery coaches. Okay. Um, they, we fund three drop-in centers uh, where people can just drop in at any point and, um, you know, they offer um, all kinds of support services, classes, groups, there's a warm line, people can volunteer so they wow. can give back. Um, and then we have a specific initiative with the recovery coaches where we're partnering with emergency departments. We're now Ooh. in 10 emergency departments around the state. Um, if somebody is brought to an emergency department with a substance-related emergency, yes. uh, the emergency department will call a recovery coach. Often the recovery coach is already there wow. because some emergency departments have now invited the coaches to have an office there. Is that right? It's awesome. But that's excellent. Yeah, that's very smart. Culture, culture and system change. Wow. And so uh, the recovery coaches will stay with the individual um, and family as long as they want them to. They'll make multiple calls yeah. to try to connect them to services and supports. Uh, and the program is only like a little over a year, and their connection rate has already been about 96%. Wow, that's awesome. amazing. That it, is just awesome. Rock stars. Wow, you yeah. seem so proud of that, too. I'm so that, proud of that's them. One. I'm, I'm glad I really to see am. That's I'm, great. I'm, I'm proud of their work. I'm proud of their um, their passion and exactly. commitment for the for just wow. helping people to have opportunities to experience recovery. Right. Um, and the program really has been so impactful that uh, Senator Murphy yeah. and another uh, senator, and his name escapes me now, but essentially they put together federal legislation oh. to require recovery coaches in emergency departments across the country. Really? Yeah. That's wonderful. Now, so we're talking awesome. about the opioids crisis here, but it's, yeah. it's beyond that as well, though, right? I mean, alcoholism, yeah. um, I can imagine other addictions uh, as well. Yeah. And is that, is that uh, more also include uh, in the mental health spectrum of issues as well? Or is the recovery coaches strictly for... Uh, uh, drug addictions. Yeah, it's interesting that the um, within the mental health field, some sometimes the term that's used is, is sort of peer support specialist or okay. recovery support specialist. Okay. 
um, there's a lot of sort of dialogue in the in the field around sort of what what term works best and Got that's it. a whole other that could be a whole other show gotcha. <laughs> um, but there are you know we work with another group called uh, advocacy unlimited okay. um, and they fund uh, recovery support specialists okay. uh, they have a, a training they call recovery university okay. um, and the recovery support specialists will work with people often on the mental health side ah, okay what we know though is it is rarely that black and white right, you know a right. person may is often struggling with both you right. know both mental health and addictions sure, for, sure. for some people and so um, so the coaches or peer support specialists on either side often end up working with people and grappling with both issues. Oh that's super well yeah. thank you we have one more segment if you're okay. really to hang out for another uh, 10 minutes or so. Absolutely yeah. Uh, again I'm uh, State Senator George Logan you are tuned into the Senate reports and we'll be back shortly with our third segment. Let's face it there's a lot you don't know about sickle cell disease. That it's not contagious. It's hereditary. That it can be unbearable. That you could have the gene that passes it on to your children. But not even know it. And that there's a simple test so you can know it. Let's face it, there's a lot you don't know about sickle cell disease. And that's a disease too. Call the 211 info line to learn more. Yo, I went all the way up to the 12th grade. You know, and I was skipping school. I was selling. I was out there doing bad things because I thought I could just get the fast way. My aunt knew she came busting at me, came hitting, knocking me upside the head, telling me, you know, to stay in school because they told her, they called in. Parents, you know, you got to keep on top of your kids because at the end of the day, they got to stay in school for the future for y'all and your family to grow. Stay in school, it's a big deal. Hi, welcome back. I'm State Senator George Logan. You are tuned in to the Senate Reports. Uh, with us here today, we're going to continue our conversation with the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services Commissioner, uh, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman. She's here with us uh, today. Again, thanks again for sticking around for this third uh, segment here. Definitely a, a trooper here to get this important <laughs> message out uh, to the people of, uh, of Connecticut. So I'd like to uh, uh, chat a little bit about, uh, in your opinion, how can a uh, Policymakers, such as myself mm -hmm. at the state capitol, uh, help uh, in your efforts. Mm -hmm. um, the latest bipartisan budget, mm -hmm. um, as you know, preserves uh, grants for substance abuse treatment and preserves grants for uh, mental uh, health care. Mm -hmm. um, again, how do you how do you see the role that us legislators, such as myself, yeah. uh, can play with helping uh, uh, Dana out? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I think just the legislation mm -hmm. that has been passed. We can go all the way back to 2011. So really, technically, since 2011, right. um, all the way now to 2017, each year there's been legislation that's been passed. I think that's helped to advance us as a state um, in terms of uh, you know helping people to increase awareness right. or um, reduce um, act of availability right. of unused medications. Right. Um, we have a prescription drop box, or not a drop box. Well, that, yeah. but also the uh, prescription and drug monitoring program. Yes. Um, that's something that was part of legislation. Right. Um, so I say, you know, certainly keep up with the legislation because that puts things into law. Sure. Um, you know, the Good Samaritan law, that's yeah. another one I think that whenever I do forums, try yeah. to mention that one. Yeah. Um, that's a law that if somebody calls, they see that somebody is, is passed out, yeah. if they call the police mm -hmm. and the police come and there are um, substances there, they they will not be held liable. Oh, it's wow. ultimately about saving that life. Right, right. Um, or if somebody tries to uh, revive somebody and it doesn't go well, right. um, then they won't actually, be held the, liable. yeah, they won't be held liable. Wow, so that's that the Good Samaritan that's right. law, that's that. that's where that one applies. Um, yeah, so, so the legislation, I think, really, really helps. Yeah. So I, yeah. I'm, I'm on a vice chair of the uh, Public Health uh, Committee, yes. and I do know when it's uh, you know time for. Uh, um, bills to be uh, uh, presented uh, and sponsored that where you work with various legislators you come up you, your department Demas comes up with yeah. uh, sort of priority 
legislation uh, areas, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which I think has been, in my short uh, two sessions here in the, in the Capitol, have been working uh, very well. I think it's a very uh, good system. And um, also getting information from uh, the community and from the public, uh, that uh, sort of thing. Yes. And I, I certainly love the way you guys are always uh, available yeah. uh, whenever we have any questions or to bounce certain ideas off to make sure that we're uh, as best af effective in terms of the legislation that's uh, trying to be passed. So I definitely yeah. appreciate uh, all of those uh, efforts. And, and yeah. it's a team effort, Absolutely. you know, and all of us working together. Yeah, so thank you for that. it takes a village. I mean, I often say it takes a village. And so, you know, many of the, the representatives and senators have done forums in their towns. Right. And, uh, and I've participated in many of those. And I think those alone have been so helpful to get information out, as I mentioned before. Absolutely. So it truly takes a village, and we all have a role to play. So and I thank you for right your role that. as well. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah she came out to, to Hamden, and we had yeah. a forum, yeah. Opioids Forum in, uh, in Hamden, which went very uh, very well. Yeah, yeah. Very well, well put, uh, yeah, and put together very well, and great yeah. information. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you uh, did not hesitate. Uh, yeah. To come to uh, you know to my uh, district yeah. to help out, so I think that's wonderful. That's yeah. great, and you make yourself available to other uh, legislators and other just uh, community leaders yeah. uh, to chat about uh, uh, issues related to mental health or addiction yeah. or so. But thank you very much for that. You're welcome. I appreciate You're welcome. it. So now I want to chat a little bit about um, um, uh, information in terms mm -hmm. of how folks can. Uh, reach and get access to those services available. Yeah. So key uh, websites uh, and information. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a website, uh, www.drugfreect.org. Does yes. that sound familiar, right? Yes. Did I get yep. that right? Yep. Drugfreect.org yes. uh, is available, and that is a, a, a way for folks to get access to uh, yep. information and programs that are available. Yeah. Um, Let's see, addiction, so how to get addiction services. The uh, access line, you mentioned earlier, when I yeah. mentioned it again, yeah. there's an access line, so you can go through the, the website. Uh, many yeah. folks can do it on their smartphones. They That's can right. go on a, uh, on a, a desktop and get to the website, mm -hmm. or they can uh, just use the old-fashioned uh, access line yes. and call a 1-800 number, 1-800-563-4086. Yeah. Uh, uh, Does that sound yes. right? Yes, yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, and that's the uh, statewide toll-free uh, a number for people seeking treatment and information about uh, treatment and services and answered 24 hours a day that's right seven days a week that's right that's yeah. excellent yeah wow. yeah so anytime somebody needs help you know we just want them to know we're there to help right um, including providing transportation if that's necessary that's super yeah uh, so yeah. whether you're uh, yourself having a crisis personally yeah. Yeah. or you're a friend or a family member of someone uh, in crises, you can call that number 800 563 4086. Now, an another uh, area which I, th I think I'd like the, the public would like to hear more about mm -hmm. is that there is a website yes. regarding addiction bed availability because oftentimes in the uh, mental health sphere there's this yeah. issue of how many beds are available how many yes. beds are full yes. uh, and now there's an actual website and this is be and this is as a result of of uh, providing information for provi people who are providing these services and for us yeah. all to be on the sort of same page yeah. for folks that are looking uh, uh, for beds and where the availability is there's yeah. a website www.ctaddictionservices.com uh, that's right that's right, and and so we call that you know our, our real time bed availability website. Mm. Um, the nice thing about it is anytime somebody goes to that website, it'll let them know how many beds are available in the state and where. Wow. Um, and so that can be uh, valuable for for an individual if they're looking for a bed. That's super. Um, it's it's important. It, it is important. I mean, one thing we we do know though is not everybody needs a bed, mm -hmm. and that's why for us as a system, it's been important to just. Uh, fund and really have in place a broad network of services right. and supports right. um, in addition to beds. Right, um, right. Because, you know, a lot of the research and data actually shows it's not necessarily a bed that helps somebody achieve long term recovery. Very good point. You know, to it's make, not the absolutely. bed, it's often the community services and supports sure. um, that help people achieve long term recovery. So it's just um, one aspect, one a yeah. uh, in terms of uh, uh, a recovery. Uh, option or method, but it may not necessarily be exactly for you know for everyone. They need a bed necessarily. It's, yeah. It, it, yeah, it could be a service that's required, and, yeah. and some folks are, are sometimes are just in an immediate sort of uh, uh, acute crisis that need to get over that uh, you know that hump and that that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, um, I mean for some yeah. people it's it's um, you know medication assisted treatment. Mm -hmm. 
um, maybe so they're being started on buprenorphine mm -hmm. um, uh, you know that's a form of medication assisted treatment that helps to reduce the cravings uh, ah. helps uh, helps increase the likelihood that a person can um, engage and connect with outpatient services yes. um, it's it's um, often administered on an outpatient basis so yeah. a person can continue to go to work and, and do their to sort of live the sure. rhythms of their daily life sure. um, and so for, for a bed isn't necessary for everybody right, right. and in fact for some people you know being connect, disconnected um, from their community and family and just their daily sort of life rhythms, um, then worse. going back to them, it, it, sometimes that's challenging going yeah, back. Yeah. Um, for So people often talk about, you know, the multiple pathways of recovery. Ah, that's the phrase. You know, that's kind of what I was looking for. Yeah, multiple, multiple pathways, pathways to recovery. That, right. that um, everybody's recovery journey is different. For right. some people, they you know, it was valuable for them to have a bed and then to do um, uh, long-term treatment, in, in, including you know being in an inpatient facility for a while, and then do the community services and supports. Um, other people said, you know what? No, I just started on methadone or started on some other form of medication-assisted treatment, yeah. um, and that made a difference for them. They wow. were able to continue with their with their life on an outpatient basis. And, and it sounds like that's where these recovery coaches play an important role in coming because yeah. they sort of help to map that out, if you will, what's the best recovery yeah. path for the individual. It's pretty specific per yeah. individual, right? There's no uh, cookie cutter or just standard way of dealing with a, a certain yeah. uh, personal situation. Definitely. And the recovery coaches, they talk a lot about, you know, just meeting a person where they're at. Right. Um, they're not necessarily there to push treatment, 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 treatment. Right. Um, they'll certainly mention treatment options yes. as well as other um, other possibilities that oh, might super. be useful for a person. For some people, it might be connecting with a faith community or connecting with family members mm -hmm. or connecting with uh, their job or right. some other valued role or hobby. Oh, that's super. Um, so the, the multiple pathways piece, I think, is key. And I, I love that the recovery coaches really just meet people where they're at. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's great. That's like, like a great program. Uh, now, would you be willing to or able to talk about some uh, outcomes, some remarkable outcomes, uh, mm -hmm. positive uh, recovery uh, success uh, stories. You know, yeah. folks like to hear, uh, get a, a sense. You know, in, in terms of uh, uh, an, an analogy, if you will, in terms of a, or an example of yeah. uh, someone else who may be dealing with a situation that you know may be somewhat similar mm -hmm. uh, to what they're uh, dealing with. And I know we only have a little limited yeah. time, but I'm sure you must have some great are, uh, recovery there stories. There are wonderful sure. recovery stories. I mean, the resiliency. Um, that um, I get to see in my role as commissioner and, and others as well. I mean, the resiliency that many people are sort of living through um, to achieve recovery is, is really inspirational. Wow. Um, I encourage people to go to our website yeah. and our Facebook page, actually, because mm -hmm. on our Facebook page, um, we have these brief vignettes, we call them our PSAs, uh -huh. um, where people will share their stories of recovery, oh, um, where they talk excellent. about um, sort of what their recovery journey was mm -hmm. and, and um, where they are now. Right. Many people talk about giving back, yes. how becoming a peer support specialist or a recovery coach, that that's a, a key part of their recovery. That's super. Uh, and so uh, on our Facebook page, there are these brief vignettes. Um, and each vignette will have information. So yeah. either information about the family support groups that are going on or about the 1-800 number or some other valuable piece of information um, that's related to that person's recovery story. That's super. So we didn't yeah. talk too much about these family support groups. So those yeah. exist in, in, uh, throughout the state? Uh, yeah, there excellent. are, so there are, um, uh, what is it, Family Cares, I believe, or, okay. yeah, so it's, um, I mean, some of the innovations are just com sort of community-based and okay. grassroots. Sure, sure. Um, so this is not a program that we fund or, or operate, yeah. but um, there's a group of, uh, in individually, or initially it was one family, a mm -hmm. mom and her son. Wow. And now it is expanded, and they've trained other parents to be um, support group leaders, and they do these support groups all over the state. That's wonderful. Um, and so, it, so there's things like that that are bubbling up at the community right. level. I think that often is uh, is impactful and really shows that everybody everybody can play a role in this. That's everybody right. can make an impact. Well, I certainly love the role yeah. that Damon is playing, that you specifically are playing in terms of bringing folks together, getting the word out, getting mm -hmm. important information out to folks, mm -hmm. and hopefully you continue to do the good work that you're doing. And uh, you know, anything that I can do to uh, to help out, please don't you know feel free to uh, uh, let me know and don't hesitate to uh, to ask. Okay. Uh, I'm George okay. Logan. 
Uh, you are tuned in to the uh, Senate reports. Uh, we were here uh, today with the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services Commissioner, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman, here with some excellent, wonderful uh, information. I encourage folks to go to the Demas uh, website and uh, really explore and, and look at the information that's uh, available. There's a lot out there for folks. Again, uh, State Senator George Logan, the Senate reports. Please have a great and safe rest of your week. Thank you.